Hi, I'm Scotty Horry, and you're watching Snapshots of a Journey. The piece you just heard me play in a prior episode of Snapshots of a Journey was called Ileño y la Perola by Salvador Cherino, a very important, prolific composer in the circuits of contemporary classical music, especially in Europe now. And uh, he's won several awards recently for groundbreaking composition. So this piece would be a strong example, probably the strongest example in the set of videos of contemporary classical music, forward thinking music in the classical tradition uh, that I want to present for you in this program. So what is this piece about? Well, first of all, it really is about the human voice and about the marimba imitating the human voice and all the different subtle characters and emotions and sound colors we can get from things that sound like vocal sounds. Uh, so it explores the full range, especially the top range of the marimba and includes some untraditional techniques and sounds that you wouldn't usually hear from marimba. And that brings me to my first point is why does an artist choose to play a piece? That's a question that I want you to think about as you watch this video and as you continue your journey with your studies. First of all, it has to speak with, to you personally, even if you're a student uh, choosing repertoire for a recital or an experienced artist with um, festival performances, for example. You have to choose a piece that represents you and that you love playing. You have to convey that when, when you choose your repertoire. Furthermore, there's a selfless component to choosing repertoire, meaning you want to find something that you think you can do a good job with and that maybe you want to give um, exposure. You want to give people exposure to a work, maybe that's not played very often or not played uh, for a certain audience. Or maybe a composer really wants you to play a piece or write a piece for you. So with the idea of choosing repertoire in mind, I want to use myself as an example and tell you why I've chosen this particular piece. Like I said earlier, it's an example of contemporary classical music, especially in the modernist tradition. So it represents the most, it's an, it's an example of the most progressive thinking in the tradition of classical music, uh, especially in Europe. I try to include some of these pieces in every one of my concerts because, of course, I have a variety of music. I have mostly progressive rock and jazz fusion and, and more classical performance practice music. But at every one of my concerts, I always try to include a piece from this area of repertoire or an experimental piece or a brand new work by a composer. I think it's really important to represent that um, aesthetic and that type of thinking when I give a presentation. Furthermore, works like this, uh, contemporary classical works, especially in the modernist tradition uh, from European circuits, don't get performed a lot in the United States, with some exceptions in Los Angeles and New York. And they don't get performed as much in Latin America, uh, especially in some of the smaller towns that I've been visiting. So that's another initiative of mine to want to bring this particular piece to my concerts. Now, over the years, one thing I've noticed is I love playing rock music, I love playing classical music, but there's something that those two kinds of music don't give me as an artist. There's a, a certain component of me as an artist that wants to come out and express itself, uh, and I need these kind of pieces to do that. There's a lot of really interesting detail and unanswered questions in some of these pieces, so uh, yet another reason why I choose to tackle this really challenging piece and learn it and interpret it and perform it. Which brings me to uh, my next point is what makes interpreting a work like this different than let's say Bach or jazz for example? Well with Bach or jazz there's a very firm tradition in place of how to play the music. There's many disputes as to the correct way to play the music. With this music it's very subjective. There's a lot of uh, room for creativity and subjectivity in terms of interpretation because there's not as firm of, as a performance practice in place. So yes, another reason why I like choosing this piece. Now like I said, this piece is about the expressive possibility of the human voice. Amplitude, color, gesture, mood, characters, different characters, and uh, variations on the perception of the pacing of time. Uh, more reasons why I love playing this piece. All these things without the use of traditional harmony, traditional melody, or pulsed rhythm, which is prevalent in a lot of common practice music or popular music. So it's a challenge to provide a riveting performance without all those traditional components. For me too, there's some personal things that come to play when I play this piece. 
Working with children for me has made this piece really fascinating uh, because children respond very sensitively to different things you do with your voice, different uh, types of intonation or varying the volume of your voice. And uh, children also can be very creative when they use their voices as well, always making sounds and uh, singing and things like that. So I try to imagine myself uh, as a child when I play this piece sometimes. The last thing I want to say is learning Spanish and Portuguese uh, while learning this piece has been a really interesting challenge. Again, it makes me think about all the different subtleties of the shapes of the sound uh, when you're speaking or communicating with your voice and how that changes the expression. If you listen closely to El Inu y la Parola, you can hear some of these subtleties. So how do we begin the interpretive act? We have a brand new piece, a brand new score. What are our first steps? What are the thoughts that are going through your mind? First of all, is there any tradition or stylistic components to the piece that you want to think about? Uh, or aesthetics or influences of the work of the com or the composer? How does this inform your approach? What's the intention of the composer or the significance of the piece from a conceptual big picture standpoint? Is the composer willing to work with you? Are they still alive? Uh, send them an email uh, or try to make contact with them. Will this piece be a premiere? And if so, is the composer willing to make some edits beforehand? Are they willing to work with you? Try to have an integrated relationship with the composer, even if it has to be electronic or from afar. Does the piece have a history? Have there been notable performers who have performed or recorded the work? As an interpreter, it's your responsibility to have knowledge of these recordings uh, or articles, for example. You want to do a little bit of research. Uh, the PAS is a great online uh, resource, PAS online resource, uh, to check out some of these articles, for example. Uh, YouTube can be helpful, obviously, too, but you want to look into the uh, credibility of the people playing. I suggest you look for a well-known artist or a college professor. That, that way you know it's a, a credible interpretation or performance of the work. And of course, you want to start thinking about how your experience with the piece uh, is, is going to take shape. What kinds of things do the, does the piece make you think about? How do you relate to it? What kind of images uh, do you get when you're uh, becoming familiar with the work for the first time? The one thing that's particularly interesting about playing contemporary classical music in the modernist tradition is the actual process of learning the work. That's what I think makes this music a little bit unique. I've heard unanimously from three different important figures in contemporary classical music, James Dillon, uh, Brian Fernihow, and my friend Jonathan Hepfer, about this, and they all tell me the same thing. They say that learning the work, the process of practicing and having the piece take shape is almost just as important as the performance itself. And I mean that by the musical development of the performer and the metamorphosis that, that the piece takes as you prepare for that first recording or first performance. Now I want to give you an example of a step-by-step -step process. Uh, for learning your new work, which is the same process that I use to learn this piece. Number one, develop an aural relationship with the work. This is a step that a lot of students miss, okay? So I want you to find recordings of your piece and get really familiar with them aurally even before looking at the score, okay? We need to remember that music is sound. We have to get connected with sound and how it occupies a space and time. Uh, and, you, and in my opinion, you want to do that before you study the score and, and start practicing physically. So attending live performance is probably the best way to do that. If you can attend a performance of the piece you're about to play, that's the best. But B, also check out well-made recordings by well-known artists. For example, if you're going to learn Time from Marimba by Minoru Miki, you want to really familiarize yourself with Keiko Abe's recording and Robert Van Sice's recording and maybe Svetstoyanov's recording. That way you, you really have the sense of the piece and how it flows in time before you start learning it. Two, open up the score. And you want to study that score in great detail. Uh, a lot of these modernist tradition pieces or complex pieces have very, very detailed elaborate scores. And Elenio y la Perola is no exception. It's a very detailed score. So do a lot of study just in the same way you would study a, a textbook, meaning see if you can pick out all the small details, notice patterns. Uh, for example, does the composer like to use a lot of dynamic markings or maybe exercises less control? 
Uh, are they using menstrual notation or graphic notation? Just get some big picture um, ideas and familiarize yourself with what it looks like before you start playing. Another thing I found really useful is combine the two first steps. Listen to a recording while following along with a score. There's some really intense uh, cross-modal learning that takes place there uh, because you're associating very complex auditory information with very complex visual and, and cognitive information. That can be a very strong step before you get physically playing the instrument. The second step I would have for you is more of a physical training approach. And I very much agree with Lee Howard Stevens that the marimba is a very technically complicated instrument to learn how to play, and we need to have physical control over it before we can play musically. I very much agree with this idea. So find exercises that are conducive to the material in your piece, which could mean making up your own exercises, not just finding a certain page and method of movement, but be creative. To use my piece as an example, again, there's a lot of inside strokes, and by inside strokes I mean position two and three in the piece. So before I play the piece, I might take 15 minutes and warm up with some inside strokes, even if it's a simple figuration like uh, a whole tone scale or my major scales, just to get the physical motion working, uh, my muscles and my nervous system acquainted with that before I get to the piece. Okay, what I wanna do now is give you some short, specific demonstrations from my approach to Eleni La Perola and show you in more detail exactly how I'm going about learning it, including some interpretive choices, which may, dare I say it, stray from the score a little bit. Now, if you feel like you've responsibly taken in all the information from a score, I believe, well, there's a lot of differing opinions about this, but I believe you can add ideas that aren't necessarily expressed on the score. Something maybe needs a little more time or a little less time, Every situation is different. You want to consult with a good teacher or your colleagues, but you want to start making some of these decisions too. And as James Dillon used to tell me, transcend the score and get past it. So let me give you some specific demonstrations. Let's get started. The first specific example I want to give you, or general idea to get you thinking about, in this piece is the clarity of the motive, okay? And the motive is a very short figure of three notes. Three 30-second notes in a bar of 632, uh, excuse me, 30-second note triplets in a bar of 632. And they should be together as one sonority, even though on the marimba they sound like bugadum. Okay? So this sound. Now, that's a motive, or if you want to think of the motive as both of them together. Right? Or... If you want to think of that as the motive, that's fine too. But that figure shows itself all throughout the piece. And just like you would playing classical music, you want to try to be consistent with the sound of the motive, okay? Even if it's down here, okay? The articulation is different. The sonority is different. The pitches are different. The intervals are different. But it is the same motive, okay? So when you play that figure around the keyboard, You want to try to keep it consistent. As much as you can, especially in the high register, you want to keep the articulation consistent, which is definitely very much harder than it is to say, okay? And I hope I exemplified that well in the performance in the prior episode of Snapshots of a Journey, is especially when you're a high register, choose the right mallets so you can get a good tone but also consistent articulation. And especially with the pianissimos and the pianississimos and the pianississimos, you need to have all the notes speak and be clear. Easier said than done, okay? So when I'm up here, for example, okay? You can hear each of the three notes just in the same manner as I was doing this part. And in a nice hall or a nice uh, sounding room, you hear, you can hear all three of them together. Almost as if I was rolling a chord. Uh, when you have them together like this, for example, again, consistent articulation, which takes a lot of practice, especially when it's very soft. And I confess, even sometimes I ghost a note and it doesn't come out right, but that's part of the beauty of live performance, and you just have to stay committed when you're playing. Another fascinating thing that makes a performance like this very engaging is the way that the performer uses the pacing of time. And I would suggest that you exaggerate 
the quicker sections and broaden the longer sections. Okay, which does mean taking a little liberty with the score because technically some of those rolls that last over the course of a bar of 6-8, if you're studying the score, uh, if you listen to the performance, I take quite a bit more time. I almost treat it like a fermata and I really milk those long notes. And similarly, or conversely rather, when I play the faster sections, I go a little bit, I, I hurry, I scurry through it a, a little bit faster, like a, we're in South Minneapolis right now, so like a squirrel running, running to the next tree or something. So now you have these two very opposing ideas that are right next to each other. So to illustrate that, I'm gonna demonstrate a section near the end of the piece for you, okay? And I want you to listen to how much I'm exaggerating the fast and how, how much I'm exaggerating the slow and the different characters that come out when you do that. Okay, so in some of those rolls, there's bars of 6 8 and 5 8. And in fact, like I said, I'm taking more time. If I did not do this, the piece would be, I think, a little bit more static. A lot of this piece is fast moving, so I want to milk those slower sections. Okay, the next specific example I want to give you from Sherino's Ilenio y la Perola is how important it is to vary the dynamics. And I'm going to play the opening for you. We just got done talking about uh, varying the pacing of time and exaggerating the quicker parts and stretching out the slower parts. Now we're going to do the same sort of thing with the dynamics. We really want to commit to those and Shirino writes a lot of dynamics. Three P's, uh, four P's, sometimes two F's, three F's and we have to carefully acknowledge where each one of those is. So let's give a listen to the opening. So you hear that I'm, I'm really committing to those dynamics, especially if you're following along with the score. Varying the dynamics is very important, but also the softs in particular are extremely important in this piece. And as an artist, I really like to bring that out. Uh, like I mentioned before, I like to put these kinds of pieces near the beginning of my concert. When the lights go down, everyone's listening to all those soft sounds. Uh, and it's a great way to start the concert instead of starting with a bang. I like to save that to the end. So for me, it's a chance to play really sensitively, which I think is a strong suit of mine, especially those soft dynamics, with all that orchestra snare drum practice I did in school. So um, I want to play for you a small excerpt from near the middle of the piece that showcases some of these softs and their expressive possibility. Okay, still preserving the clarity of the motive, uh, still preserving the consistency of the articulation and really committing to the softs. That includes observing when there's three Ps, two Ps, a uh, mezzo piano, and so on. In that short excerpt, you notice that I slowed down quite a bit near the ending. 
that's not marked in the score, but I believe I can take a small liberty and do that because I want to preserve the articulation and I want to have a little more space and time for the bottom to bloom a little bit. Now, if you listen carefully, I'm still preserving every other component of the motive. The figure, the articulation, I'm being mindful, although it does get uh, more wet and more uh, poofy. <laughs> I have no word for that. Down there, uh, of course, but I'm, I'm mindful of that. And that seemingly awkward slowdown helps me do that. Okay, So just another small example of a uh, small idea that's an important part of interpreting a work like this. Here we go again. and then more a-tempo there. You can take a little bit of liberty as well with the techniques you use to play this music, which might produce slightly different sounds. Uh, now, Shirino is pretty specific with the technique that he suggests to do the independent rolls, uh, the tremolo effect on the bars, which is a big part of the piece. But I decided to do it two different ways. Now, there's a really, really cool moment in the piece the f is when the first time I play one of these tremolos, uh, it's sort of an exciting part where the, the texture of the piece changes, it slows down, and there's a new sound. And I, I imagine the listener kind of feeling like, whoa, what's going on? This is taking a different direction. And it's on the G. And I, I use an independent roll with my right hand, and I do the gliss with my left hand, like this. That way I can start it really, really, really soft. I always have to remind myself not to start the crescendo too early. And I can really hear the bar hum, and it kind of comes out of nothingness. Uh, and then, of course, I can bend the pitch with this hand. Now, later on in the piece, near the end, the piece gets a little more tense and fast moving. So to preserve that momentum all the way to the very end of the piece, I choose a different technique, okay, which fulfills that for me that more tense feeling. I do a, uh, a different style roll where I'm hitting the mallet on both ends of the bar. And I get a faster, more uneven, nervous kind of roll. And I like that sound for the part of the piece. And of course, it's a very different sound than earlier. So um, one demonstration of that would be on the A. And on the D. And I think that's more suitable for the end of the piece. And the first one is more suitable for the beginning. So that concludes this lesson on Salvador Sherino's Ilenio y la Perola, as well as some general coaching and advice about learning new repertoire and beginning the interpretive process. I want to thank you so much for watching Snapshots of a Journey, and please stay tuned for the next episode.